Welcome to our daily devotion, an excursion into the land of wisdom. We were foolish, but we're becoming wise. We were finding ourselves questioning, but now we're finding answers. And Solomon is helping us in the book of Ecclesiastes to have strategies of thinking about life that cause us to live at a level wherein we have a God's eye view of the world. Uh, we're not holding on to the philosophical structures that have been handed down to us through the education system or through the business world or the government or any of the, any of the other systems that uh, people build their lives upon thinking that uh, they might provide us with the answers that we need. They don't have the answer. God's word has the answer. And so we're in Ecclesiastes chapter four. Ecclesiastes chapter four begins uh, a whole series of sayings, um, especially after we pass verse four. Uh, we just get a series of sayings that's much like what we have presented to us in the Proverbs, except, except in Proverbs we have practical wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, the sayings are more philosophical in their perspective, and they all emerge out of the uh, foundation that has been laid to us in the first three chapters of Ecclesiastes. Today, we're looking at how we can find meaning in oppression wherever there's oppression or suffering. Again, verse one, Ecclesiastes chapter four, again I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. And I saw the tears of the oppressed and they have no comforter. And power was on the side of the oppressors and they have no comforter. And then verse four, and I saw that all the labor and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbor, and this too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. When people arrived in Auschwitz, they were already in a pretty bad shape. Having been, having been taken from their families, they were transported long distances over a long period of time, and those on the outside of the carriages were, they'd froze to death, and uh, the trains were so crowded that children suffocated on the way. And the Nazis got rid of 20% of the people before they were even unloaded off the trains. They arrived in Auschwitz feeling uh, they were starving and freezing and grieving and in shock. And there they read a sign. The sign said, work shall set you free, which would have given them some hope, except it was a cruel joke. And to prove its sarcasm, they were told to carry a hundred pound sack of wet salt from one end of the camp to the other which was a huge distance because the camp was like a large city housing tens of thousands of people. And after taking it to the other side of the camp, they were made to carry it back again and put it back where they found it. It was poetic in its malevolence because they were harnessing the human compulsion to be engaged in useful activity and demonstrating how absolutely futile it is. It was a parody of meaninglessness, the meaninglessness of humanity, the meaninglessness of courage, the meaninglessness of hope, the meaninglessness of work, and the meaninglessness of life. And the whole aim of oppression is to break the spirit of a person, to get people to give up, to get them to say, what does it matter? What does it matter if I work hard? 
What does it matter if I pay my taxes? What does it matter if I do good or do evil? Matter is an interesting word because there is matter that you can touch as in space, time, and matter. And then there's matter as in what matters. And what matters is more real than matter. And when it seems like nothing matters, then the only thing you have to look forward to is death. And so the moment someone in Auschwitz was broken, they either died or they were killed. The necessary thing in such circumstances is to find meaning. This is what Ecclesiastes is actually telling us. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how. In other words, people need to have a meaning. This is where faith comes in. There's no doubt that those who held on to faith fared better in Auschwitz and in any oppressive circumstance than those who had not. After the death of his friend in Auschwitz, Viktor Frankl, who was in Auschwitz, in, in the camp there, recognized there is such a distinct correlation between the state of mind and the human body's immunity our immune system, that the sudden loss of courage and hope is deadly. Faith withstands oppression. It sustains the spirit of a man with hope that originates beyond the evil of this world. And whenever opportunity arises, we must give, give people a why, a reason, whereby they're equipped with the strength that enables them to bear with the terrible how of oppression. So this is the ultimate end to which all of us should devote our lives. Whenever opportunity presents itself, we must give someone a why, a reason. In other words, we must give them hope. Opportunity may arise around the next corner of the road. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. If you stumble upon the opportunity to reduce someone's suffering and act on it, then that would make you a good person. At least that's the point of the Good Samaritan. That story says that what made him good was that the person that had been bruised and broken upon the road that others walked past, the Good Samaritan looked after. And that's how he got the name of being the Good Samaritan, because he was the one who took notice and did something about it. Suffering makes people question life, so to reduce suffering in the world provides the answer. If suffering creates the question, then to reduce suffering provides the answer. In other words, it provides meaning. So there's many ways that we can reduce suffering in the world. You might choose to become a doctor or a teacher or a nurse or a pastor. Back in the early church, they would call pastors doctor because they were the physicians of the soul. Storytellers give meaning to life, and so you might choose to become an author, or you, you could become a good role model, or you could feed the hungry. There's many practical ways to diminish suffering in the world. Also, everybody can offer comfort. Comfort helps the oppressed to make sense of the world. It's no wonder that Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the comforter because the disciples were about to be faced with the loss of their master. And so Jesus said that, that there is the comforter will be coming. Uh, Paul wrote, 
Blessed be the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort that we ourselves are comforted by God. Power is always on the side of the oppressor. So if you choose to offer comfort, then you'll appear weak, like Jesus, who through suffering gave us hope. So this gives a true understanding to the phrase, let the weak say, I am strong. Think about it. Every day brings opportunity to exercise the power of our existence for good or for evil, to comfort or to oppress, to give hope or shut people down, to bless or to curse. And I pray that you'll, in your opportunities today, to provide blessing and comfort and goodness, that you will take that opportunity and not walk past it, but fulfill the call of your life in the earth and provide meaning to people in this world. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow.